it's hard. It's kind of that little picture there. That's all that we can see, unfortunately. But I don't know of a way to make it any better, unfortunately. But so long as I think Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, UNBC's terrorist campus. It uh, looks like uh, we got some good exposure on day the CBC Daybreak North this morning. I'm glad to see so many of you here, including many new faces. Uh, my name is Phil Burton. I'm the uh, chair of Northwest Region for uh, UNBC. Uh, my office is, is here in this building. If you're uh, not familiar with our programs, we have uh, really active cohorts of, of uh, Bachelor of Education students, social work students, and uh, um, who am I missing? The nursing students, and we're growing a science program. Some exciting things happening at the campus here these days. Across the hall, we now have a, a full classroom of uh, students uh, learning environmental monitoring technology, and we're giving them university credit for that, so we're hoping to recruit some of them into, into even uh, further education. You may not have noticed, because it's not well maintained, but we now actually have a bus stop out on Keith Avenue. Most of our students and staff haven't quite learned the, the bus routes yet, but that's uh, also been a, something we've been battling for for several years. Um, when you came in or in front of you at the, at the table here, you'll see our lineup of speakers this winter for the winter semester. This is our first offering, so everything from uh, biology and chemistry through to some historical uh, perspectives and, uh, and uh, whales and noise pollution. I'm interested in hearing that one soon. So please do uh, tack that up on your on your fridge. I guess we should be giving away fridge magnets next. Mm -hmm. And uh, do come to those topics that are of interest to you. I always enjoy them. Um, we're pleased to kick it off with uh, Professor John Christinger from Northwest Community College. He uh, is one of our stalwart contributors, uh, both in terms of this program, you may have caught his presentation last semester, but also in teaching our nursing students and a number of our biology students. So he's, he built some of those foundations on which, on which we build. And um, John's background is as a biochemist and pharmacologist, and he's going to talk to us about the biological and chemical basis for aging. And if I may say so, I think this is a topic which maybe most of us, once we are over 50, really get interested in. So, look at Owen, including the presenter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so anyway, I'm, I'm a pharmacologist, like you pointed out, and uh, so I studied how drugs work, and that led me into um, working in cell biology because ultimately you affect what cells do. That got me into molecular genetics because I was working on drugs that affect, like steroids, how it affect genes, and so eventually you deal with all the facets of how life normally works, and then where it goes sideways when it doesn't. So when, uh, I, I put a, a provocative question here because people are always interested in this, is there immortality, like in this physical life, can there be an eternal youth? Um, yes and no. So I'm looking at all the facets as much as I can. This is a multifaceted problem, and uh, I can only skim the surface, and it's also um, highly chemical, so if you don't have a real deep background, you have to kind of take my word for it. I'm trying to go through it. Uh, I shortened about what I have to present by 90% to be able to do it in 40 minutes, and then to leave time for questions, because that's probably more interesting than me regurgitating really excruciating detail in all this. So. Um, let me start out uh, with looking at, um, how does this work here? Uh, so I'm teaching, by the way, pathophysiology. So patho means suffering, and uh, so pathology is the study of disease, and pathophysiology is, you know, when we figure out, you know, why are you the way you are with your illness? I don't need to explain to you what all the signs of aging are. Many we were very familiar with ourselves, and. Uh, some are outwardly visible, like shown in this uh, slide here. And uh, no matter where we go, the neuromuscular system, the cardiovascular system, our immune system, they all go downhill as we get older. And so why is this? Is this normal? Can this be prevented? So, for example, here are some facts. Um, it says here, the loss of structure and function in aging. The figure on my next slide compares uh, the percentage of functioning tissue, if you compare a 75-year-old with a 30-year-old uh, person. 
And so here are the sobering numbers. Uh -oh. <laughs> so the brain weight has decreased almost by half. The blood supply by 20%, cardiac output by 30%, and so on. So you can see, it's, by the way, it says body weight <coughs> has decreased. Of course, this is assuming a normal weight person, <coughs> typically by muscular um, atrophy. Of course, many people become obese because of their lifestyle. Then, of course, that will be different. So these are the facts of life. What actually is aging? You know, I, I'm not an English scholar, but normally age just means, well, you have more years in your record than somebody else. But in real life, we know it always means something is not as new as it was anymore. The car people, they call it a previously owned vehicle. <laughs> well, it was used and it's not like new anymore. So in our field, aging is actually the progressive loss of physiological function that increases the probability of death. So um, it's interesting, Hollywood sometimes portrays an elderly person peacefully lying in their bed, speaking to their grandchildren, and then closes their eyes and dies. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's Hollywood, I'm sure you all know that. Uh, somebody who passes away was ill. If you hadn't had any medical problem, well, you wouldn't have died. So then aging that leads to death always has caused some medical problem. So why is this? And what are the main culprits? Um, so in Canada, as in most industrial countries, cardiovascular <coughs> disease and cancer cause about half of the mortalities. So and then there are other, like lung diseases, uh, nervous system, for example, Alzheimer's. It's very common to have dementia. It may not kill the person, but it can. It can lead to complications that ultimately cause some death. So uh, this little list accounts for 71 or so percent of the reasons why people pass away. So obviously, we, most people know this, what causes these events to be so common? So aging in the natural world, I'm saying here, um, I've been once accused by one of my nursing students, why do you talk about evolution? I'm in a nursing program, I'm not a biology student. All of life is just pervaded with the, the evidence and the consequences of evolution. So, and when you study aging, you also have to look at other animals who age just like we do, and they have all the medical problems, many of that we do as, have as well. So when you look at uh, mortality in, in all animal populations, very common reasons for that in the wild are starvation, predation, infectious diseases, environmental disasters like cold, drought, floods, fires. Uh, many, many organisms can't run away fast enough and that's their demise. So most critters uh, don't have a chance to live long enough to actually become old because something else happens prior to that. So for any organisms, survival of species is more important than long life, because that's what evolution is about. It selects for something that can <coughs> persist over long periods of time, and that's not just an individual's life. In regards to, to us humans, so Homo sapiens, um, in the 21st century um, versus just 100 years ago, at the start of the 21st century, pneumonia and influenza caused more death and I'm calling it organic diseases. Obviously, these are infectious diseases. If you could stay clear of those critters that cause pneumonia and influenza, well, you couldn't be part of that statistics. And in theory, that's possible. Just don't mingle with any people. Um, but you cannot hide from cancer or cardiovascular disease. Uh, why not? So we have managed in uh, the last hundred or so years uh, to improve our lifestyle by having clean drinking water and food. We know how to deal with sewer, uh, well, discharge, etc. We invented antibiotics. Well, we discovered them and we invented new ones. Uh, we figured out how to immunize against former killer diseases. So this and many other medical advances, drugs, surgery, have greatly increased the average lifespan. Now that is important. There was always people who were lucky and to live a long life because they had luck to not have pneumonia, influenza, they didn't have an appendicitis, so they escaped all those accidental problems, but a old age still got them. So 
Nowadays, because we have solved so many problems, a lot of people now live long enough to show those chronic problems of old age. So life expectancy can be calculated in multiple ways. The insurance companies are very good at that. Uh, one way of doing this is at birth. So when you're born today in Canada, uh, you, statistically speaking, have a chance to live 80.7 years uh, on average, so males, because they smoke more, they drive drunk, they jump off bridges. Um, so they do a lot of things to themselves that makes them die more likely earlier than female, so there's a difference still. Um, by the way, if you're already 55 years old and you calculate your life expectancy, so this is not at birth, you already can't die anymore of SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, because you're not an infant anymore. Uh, it is unlikely that you die of postnatal complications from a difficult birth because you're 55, this is long past. So if you recalculate based on your health, of course, then actually the life expectancy is much higher than this number. So now in 1976, uh, so that's not that long ago, all of us were around then, that number was 73 years. And um, when you look at these stats here, in the year 1900, the life expectancy was at birth 47 years. In 1976, it jumped to 73 years. And look at the change over this short period of time due to medicine and technology. Uh, the incidence of death caused by influenza and pneumonia versus cancer has just flipped. So what does that tell you? I'll show you already this graph here. I'll come back to this. Why is this? Uh, you all know from life experiences, young people rarely ever have cancer. And as we get older, this is the true correlation of age versus this number here, number of death from cancer per 100,000 people uh, specified by age. So it's an exponential increase if we live long. So obviously, if you have a life expectancy that goes only to the mid 40s, of course there's not many people who will have cancer. We haven't lived long enough. So now, Aging in, in animal populations is highly diverse. Uh, this curve, these curves show multiple scenarios. For example, most commonly today, and it says here uh, for uh, this, in this case it says the statistics of a white woman living in the United States in this period, so obviously these are some historical numbers. So basically very few people die as children, very few as adults, and then typical curve once we get older, we get into our 70s, health problems arise and then eventually very few live to be 100. On the other hand, if you go in this case to a developing country in India in this time period here, 1921 to 38, what do you make out of this? There's high infant mortality, probably poor um, perinatal care. So there's, well these are facts, these are stats, this is not somebody's theory. So a very different medical system and also a different time, of course, uh, where the mortality curve is very different. Curve C actually shows if there was at any time in life, the day you were born, the day you were 20, 40, 60, if there was always the same chance to die, then you would follow this pattern here. There are other creatures <laughs> who have a very drastic disappearance, uh, for example, um, Curve number D, these are creatures, um, curve number C, sorry. Uh, these are, no, I already discussed that. Curve number D is on the next slide here. Uh, these are populations where the mortality early in life is absolutely staggering. Uh, that happens in many creatures um, that produce vast number of offspring who all die. The salmon is an example. Most uh, juveniles don't survive in the rivers, but of course, Evolution, it works or else they wouldn't be here. So it is well and sick for them to produce large number of offspring so that enough survive to actually go to the next generation. Now, of course, we all live in the north and we know about salmon. Well, they have their own agenda. They make a decision themselves when to die. So here's a whole different story where their hormones tell them, go reproduce, and that's the end of them. It's a very special case. 
Now, when you look at other animals, um, so we, of course, are vertebrate animals, and some don't bother having their body temperature regulated, and they're called cold-blooded, like fishes, amphibians, uh, reptiles. Uh, many know that some of them have very long lifespans, like tortoises can reach 150 years. No human has ever come close to living that long. Um, so how can that be? Uh, many of those have no fixed size. Like we humans stop growing in height once we go past puberty. Height, and we know exactly why this is, you cannot grow your bones anymore once <coughs> that growth plate is ossified and that has hormonal reasons. Well, they don't have this. They can grow throughout life, so they add new tissues. Uh, they constantly replace uh, most of their cells. And they have a low metabolic rate. They use very little oxygen. I'll come back to this. Um, when you go to warm-blooded creatures, if you compare a 75 kilogram alligator, cold-blooded, to the same size human, a human consumes and needs 10 times the calories per day to live. So, well, they make 10 times more problems in their metabolism. I'll come to this. So warm-blooded warm critters, um, because of the high metabolic rate, uh, have very different lifespans. So birds and mammals are warm-blooded, they have a fixed adult size, and um, so if they're protected from the environmental hazards, predation, etc., they show signs of aging. So most people are aware that lifespans are very different uh, in creatures. For example, uh, humans, I mentioned about 80 years, and it all evolutionary makes sense. We have a low reproductive rate. Humans can't have nearly as many offspring as rats or, or, or dogs. Um, the mortality uh, is fairly low. We're aware of that too. Um, we have a very well functioning DNA repair system to fix problems. Some people think, oh, this causes mutation, that's bad. Well, we can handle some mutagens, some carcinogens in the environment because we do have mechanisms to fix DNA problems. And ours are better than short-living creatures like rats and mice, we know that. So natural selection in humans give an edge to people who have, or to individuals who have, good DNA repair systems for a long lifespan. So here is a correlation of the ability to fix DNA problems in various animals. So we are at the top, the elephant, cow, hamster, rat, mouse, and shrew. So, uh, I mean, size-wise, here's a little anomaly. Elephants and cows are bigger than us. But other than that, the general rule is smaller mammals have a short lifespan, high metabolic rate, and uh, they don't really take care of the DNA. It's not necessary. They don't live long enough to be bothered by the problems of not fixing the problems. So uh, there is a very strong correlation of the effectiveness of fixing DNA problems. So a mouse has a lifespan of about two years that is, of course, in captivity. In the wild, they, they wouldn't live that long. So they have a high reproductive rate, high mortality, um, to either predation or we humans have invented other contraptions to get rid of them. So DNA repair for longevity doesn't really make sense for them. Uh, evolution has never uh, bothered to make this a point of their survival on the long run. So th and then scientists always study those weird exceptions to learn, you know, why, why is, <coughs> sometimes the story is different. Like, oops, like this, um, I'm not familiar with this remote. Um, a mouse looks very similar to a bat. In fact, the Germans call it the flying mouse or the deflator mouse. So, but they are very different creatures. Uh, a mouse actually lives in captivity up to two and a half years, whereas a bat uh, can live 41 years minimum. Uh, it's difficult to figure out how long they can live in the, in the wild because you need to be able to track them. So there's a huge difference, even though metabolically they're very similar. And I'm saying here, the scientists say, I call it a common sense explanation. Uh, that thing can fly. So it's much harder to get to as, as a predator is concerned. So flight reduces the chance of early death. And over time then, it favors, if you can fix your long-term health problems, 
because, well, you're not getting eaten by predators. Um, the biochemical explanation of this, we know this, uh, those critters have mitochondria, so these are the little organelles where respiration takes place. They are less, a lot less prone to oxidative damage. I'll explain what reactive oxygen species are uh, shortly. So we know actually what is the key to those critters curbing the long-term problems of oxidative damage. It's the mitochondrial DNA sequences. So evolution has selected in favor of them and that's why they can live so long. Now, when it comes back to us humans, um, in case anybody can, uh, can translate this, hops and malt, God preserve it, right? So obviously this old gentleman, he's still happy, must have not smoked a lot, he can still toot that uh, bugle there and he enjoys his beer. So we have about five solid lines of well, theory, or other facts supporting a theory then that explain why we age. Uh, we have some cells that are just too old and worn out. I'm phrasing this all in sort of layman's term. I'll give you some more scientific explanation in a minute. We have connective tissue that becomes more lousy over time. We have cells that run themselves in the ground by constant replacement cell division. The oxidative damage ruins mitochondria and proteins, and ultimately even the DNA in the nucleus mutates over time. So now, the first one, it says the wear and tear in tissues with terminally differentiated cells. So uh, some of you may know, by the time you're a child, probably before you get 10 years old, you have all the neurons you ever have. And you can only lose them. If you get banged in the head, if you get terribly drunk, uh, the number goes downhill. Neurons cannot go into mitosis, meaning cell division, to replace missing ones. Uh, somehow they park themselves in what's called G0 phase in the cell cycle. They don't replace each other. The same is true for skeletal muscle, for cardiac muscle, uh, most structures in the kidneys, uh, the lens of the eye. None of these cells, once we construct these organs, ever get replaced. So you're stuck with what they are and what they have in them. The lens cells are even worse. The proteins you made as an feet as an embryo, they're still in your eye and you look through them until they become cloudy and you have a cataract. And if it wasn't for surgery, you would look through a curtain for the rest of your life. So it's these proteins are damaged over time. So then some cells are becoming too old and worn out. So tissue and organs made up of cells that are constantly replenished. For example, uh, blood cells. An 85-year-old male, well, female male, a uh, man uh, produces plenty of red blood cells in their bone marrow. They live 120 days and they get re replaced. So that system works really well throughout the whole lifespan and probably would work for another 50 years, who knows? So also the lining of all tissues from the mouth to the anus, there's an epithelium sheet. Uh, those cells are constantly replenished. So they're not getting old, they either slough off or they commit suicide and get recycled. But there's a problem right here. So the tissues are renewed nicely, so they're replaced by new cells. But that comes at a price. Because when I make a new cell, I must copy all the DNA. That is 6.4 billion bases of material has to be copied faithfully. Nothing is faithfully. Perfect. So there's errors. So every time a cell in the bone marrow, in the epithelia, divides, it makes a few errors, and they don't get fixed. So, and that becomes a cumulative problem. And one upshot of this is 85% of cancers, which are the result of such mutations, <coughs> come from <coughs> epithelial tissues. Breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, skin cancer. It's always the epithelia in those tissues that started the tumors, and that is the reason why. So, in other words, muscle cancer is extremely rare. Bone cancer is, primary bone cancer is extremely rare. Muscle cells don't make copies throughout life, so they don't make errors. So it's very, very rare that the muscle cell will start a tumor. The next point, the connective tissue. Um, oops, connective tissue 
Um, I'm for interest here. Uh, these are bones, tendons, ligaments, uh, the skin, the thick part, not the ones that you can touch, that's the epidermis. The layer below that, from which we make leather for shoes and belts, that's the dermis, that's connective tissue. And then there's many, I call it unseen sheets of connective tissue everywhere in your body. The filtration device in the kidney, or I use as an example heart valves, which control the flow of blood. They're little flaps of connective tissue. We cannot keep those structures intact for long periods of time. The key of connective tissues is uh, there is a lot of extracellular matrix. So I took a little, this is an electron micrograph. So there are little epithelial cells here. And here's a sheet of connective tissue. So this is a protein sheet, like a little piece of saran wrap. And these little strings are fibers of collagen. So the cells have produced this, they're called fibroblasts. And unfortunately, it's like when you build your house, if you put a wrong two by four in, you can take a nail puller and pull it out, cut it right and put a new one in. It's replaceable easily. If you pour a concrete floor with rebar, and once that is set, and there's something wrong with it, you're in trouble. Uh, in life, we have no mechanism to really recycle this stuff. So you make this collagen protein matrix, and we have no way of degrading it, recycling it, and make it new. So it gets old, <coughs> again, by chemical uh, modifications. I did my PhD on, on uh, bone uh, drugs, and I went to a conference, and one smart professor, whose name I can't remember, he said this. He said, you are as old as your connective tissue. So I already said, poor repair, bad turnover, uh, the skin, for example, it takes 15 years to remove half of the matrix in the skin. In these 15 years, you have accumulated even more damage, and you still have 50% to go. So it's a runaway train. You cannot keep your skin like new. So then that leads to compromised function everywhere. Everywhere we have thin sheets like fascia, the tendons get stiffer and tend to tear. Um, so do ligaments. Uh, bones are relatively good at that, uh, but joints because they contain cartilage. Uh, some of you may know if you damage your cartilage or if the doctor tells you you have osteoarthritis, there's nothing we can do. You can take glucosamine sulfate and make the pharmacist rich. It doesn't work. We cannot convince chondrocytes to recycle and replace broken cartilage. It doesn't work. So you have to live with the basically deteriorated matrix. And of course, blood vessels are the pipelines of nutrients in our bodies. And they have walls with connective tissue. So the reason why in old people we have likely strokes, coronary heart disease, the renal function goes downhill, in part is because the connective tissues are lousy when they get old. Here's a picture of two people. Uh, this person. Uh, a monk who probably spent a <coughs> little time outside in the sun. And this person, uh, substantially younger, lived in the high altitude of the Andean uh, mountains in, in Peru. So most people probably know sun has a lot of UV radiation. <coughs> it causes chemical modification in the collagen fibers in the skin, leading to wrinkles. So obviously this person is lucky that she hasn't had got cancer from all the UV radiation. And that guy is lucky that he's alive with 91 and that he never became vitamin D deficient. Mm -hmm. So it's all a trade-off. Now, blood vessels, just to give you a little idea, uh, all major larger blood vessels have walls with extensive sheets of connective tissue. They go old. They get stiff. They get less elastic. So and then, well, they don't work as they did when they were new. And you have them everywhere in your body. Now, there's a genetic basis uh, for, for aging, uh, hard to explain uh, in, in, in brief time. Some cells have a limited lifespan, and uh, there's cumulative problems with DNA damage as they replicate. That whole thing is called <coughs> cellular senescence. So a telomere is the tip of a chromosome. So chromosomal molecules, they're very large DNA molecules, they're linear meaning they have a beginning and an end. And those tips are special. They're called telomeres. 
And whenever a cell divides, a normal cell, um, the telomeres get a bit shorter. If you have an hour, I can explain to you why that is. And uh, there is a solution, I'll come to it, but most cells don't have that solution. <coughs> so what that means, a cell, as it divides and makes proliferation go, makes tissues grow and repair, it runs its chromosome in the ground. So cells of fibroblast, chondrocytes, whatever they are, they have a limited lifespan. There's a number of replication they are allowed to do, and then they die because they erode the chromosome. So that problem can be overcome. There's an enzyme called telomerase, which fixes the problem. So the telomerase <coughs> actually adds to chromosome, so it builds them up. In fact, that's where the telomeres came from in the first place. So now, common sense now, well, why do we have telomerase and who uses that? Well, the cells that constantly must divide, they can't afford lying the chromosomes in the ground, so they use telomerase. So all the, the bone marrow cells that make my red blood cells, the white blood cells, they have telomerase. All the epithelia that I just mentioned a minute ago, who need to be constantly renewed during life, they have telomerase. And of course, if I make um, reproductive cells for the next generation, I better give them nice long telomeres or else they're already screwed up from start. So that comes at a price. Nature is very smart and um, systematic in inventing all these things. So. The telomerase has a good side. Uh, it's a protective mechanism against cancer. If a cell that is not supposed to continue dividing all the time decides to do that, so it starts making a tumor, that's one reason why spontaneously tumors disappear. Because if they don't turn on the telomerase enzyme function, they run themselves in the ground and die. So it's a built-in safety mechanism against this. So then guess what? If you actually do have a tumor that persists and leads to cancer, in nearly all tumor cells, the telomerase gene is turned on. And by nature, in epithelia, it's already turned on in a normal cell, which explains once more why those are the ones that cause nearly all the cancers. Now I'll give you just a few tidbits of scientific facts where people Ticker with animals, tinker with animals, and show, wow, you turn one gene off or on, and wow, the, the mouse or whatever critter lives longer or shorter. A knockout mouse is a, a very sophisticated beast. You can nowadays create animals where you deliberately remove one gene. It's in, in a sense, it's very simple. If you want to know what a spark plug does in your car, we'll take it out. See what happens. If you want to know what these tires are for, take them off. That's exactly what this is. You, you knock out a gene and then you see what's wrong with this animal or any other organism. When you knock out the gene for telomerase, you see all kinds of problems in these mice and their lifespan goes down by half. So obviously it's mighty important for them. Um, this, um, these two organisms are the mo one of the model organisms that were sequenced as the Human Genome Project was carried out. So the fruit fly and this nematode worm are model organisms whose entire genetic makeup was sequenced. So, and people are mutating genes in them. So single genes can increase the lifespan in Drosophila, C. elegans, that's that critter here, mm -hmm. and in mice. Mm -hmm. And uh, some genes, uh, when they're suppressed, they have to do with uh, fostering growth and maintenance of tissues. So there's Numerous examples, so for example, it says here knockout mouse for this is insulin um, related growth factor number one, 25% reduction or increase in the lifespan. Uh, here is a protein, I don't want to bother you with what the heck this is. Another example, 20 to 30% influence on um, the lifespan. By the way, this gene that has an effect on longevity is regulated by vitamin D. How interesting is that? So now, to the consequence of respiration, the oxidative damage. So cold-blooded animals, those fishes and reptiles, they have such a low metabolic rate, meaning they use so little oxygen compared to us, they have much less of a problem with this. Look here again, they make transgenic mice. 
Normally, your hypothalamus tells you when you have 37 degree body temperature. We have no idea how the hell it does that. The mouse is the same way. So, but people have figured out how to make mutants where the thermostat is tweaked. So look at this, you just change the body temperature of a mouse by half a degree. And it lives, interesting, the males live 12% longer and the females 20%. Convince your partner to turn the heat down. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work. It does. Now, very interesting too. Calorie restriction. Uh, that's a very uh, gruesome method. So, the lifespan of all organisms studied, when you put them on a semi-starvation diet, the lifespan goes up. So, and semi-starvation, it is what it says. Uh, you cannot eat a breakfast like this. If you put animals on a caloric restriction where they just not die, so they're close to starvation, they live much longer. Uh, I don't think they'll be happy. So people then are interested, why is this? What is different when you are running so short on food supplies? So one example, just to give you one, there's many, many others. Um, when you are short in nutrients, you will have less glucose. In fact, that's one problem in diabetes people's blood glucose levels is always higher than it should be. Well, as innocent as glucose is, if you have the wrong amounts, it causes trouble. Uh, glucose can cause, uh, it's called glycation of proteins. Glucose can react with proteins in a random fashion. That's not, some of you may know something about biochemistry. Glycosylation is a normal attachment of sugar. Nature has designed to do that. Glycation it's just a chemical thing that happens that's not normal. The more glucose you have exposed to proteins, the more they do that. And um, we call those advanced glycation end products. Isn't that funny? Well, it spells age. <laughs> so this causes trouble because you make proteins that don't work. And uh, so, for example, that's one contributor why collagens, elastins, and connective tissue start to malfunction. And even worse, you can make proteins that you can't recycle anymore. We cannot afford storing garbage in cells. When you can not something, cannot something recycle, it becomes a waste that you store. Um, most of the stuff you can't see because you need to take somebody to the laboratory, take biopsies and do chemical uh, testing to prove many of the things I'm telling you. But look at your skin and some things you can't see. Besides the wrinkles, here's another one you can see. Those brown spots you see in people's skin that are older, uh, they're called, well, age spots or lipofuscine uh, or aging pigments. That's an accumulation of material that cannot be recycled. And you find this in neurons. In fact, that's part of the reason why we have Alzheimer's. They start accumulating proteins like this that you can't get rid of can't break them down and recycle. And in this case here, it also includes some pigments uh, from melanocytes, so that's why it has a color. It, they may be colorless. So they happen in any tissue, <coughs> it causes them to malfunction, muscles don't work as well, and so on. So in calorie restriction, you reduce all that because there's less of these oxidations going on. Now the oxidative damage uh, has more problems. Um, Collateral oxidative damage, I call it here. So respiration is one. Here's another one. When white blood cells attack bacteria or parasites, they actually squirt bleach on them. They actually make a mutagenic chemical called hydrogen peroxide. And when I say collateral damage, well, the damage was supposed to kill the invading microbe, but I always cause some problems to the other cells of my own body. So that's the collateral damage. The more inflammations you have, the more likely you have problems, even if you survive the insult. To the point, chronic inflammations cause cancer. We know that too, because these are mutagenic things. So, so we need an immune system to defend ourselves, but then it comes at a price. It can harm ourselves on the long run. So nothing, we, can, we can't do one or the other. Now, the oxygen radicals that form in respiration, I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, mitochondria is where they form, so the mitochondria have their own little genome. 
mitochondria are organelles, they have their own DNA, and it's right in the line of fire because it's right near the source of those evil oxygen molecules. The nuclear genes are further away, so they're a little less under fire. These oxygen radicals, they can harm uh, everything. They harm membrane lipids. They change low-density lipoprotein particles. That's the bad cholesterol. It gets worse by oxidation and the deposition in arterial walls. Proteins, once more, get changed by these to become non-degradable junk. So for most of these processes, and I don't have time to explain some of those, there are extreme versions of human diseases where people age very fast. Like in 10 years, you look like a 90-year-old person. There are diseases like this when one gene doesn't work, and some of those processes just run away and go very fast. Now, the oxidative uh, problem. Um, normally, in the ox we all know we need oxygen. So oxygen is used in the mitochondria, and biochemists can measure all this stuff. One in 2,000 events where oxygen is put to normal use, an oxygen radical comes up. So this O2 molecule, it has a single electron here and a minus one charge, and it's radical. It flies through the cell. It will react with anything in its way that has a double bond, in DNA and lipids and proteins. So it causes chemical change that is no good. So, and we can defend ourselves. Uh, we have uh, two enzymes, superoxidisplotase and catalase. By the way, there are critters, they don't use oxygen. There are anaerobic bacteria. For them, oxygen is super bad, it kills them. So, and they don't have this luxury, we do. So we actually have some enzymes, they can handle those radicals. And once more, we can test it. You make a knockout mouse that doesn't have these genes, they have premature cancer and death because they can't defend themselves at all against those oxygen radicals. So transgenic mice uh, with a human gene for catalase expressed in mitochondria. So you give them a hand and actually defending themselves a bit better, you can e increase their life chance, uh, lifespan. Uh, transgenic mice with a DNA polymerase for copying um, the mitochondrial genes defective, premature aging, reduced lifespan. So there's examples of the examples. Um, oxidative stress can actually cause an entire chromosome to break in half. That normally is a total disaster for the cell and uh, we repair those breaks. And um, again, I can spend an hour explaining how that works and why we do it. And the thing is, we can detect that. When you take, here it says, when you take a 70-year-old person's cell to the laboratory and you analyze the chromosomes for those double-strand breakpoints, which we can find, you find about 2,000 events have happened in each cell where that had to have been fixed. So, and those repairs make mistakes. They always leave a piece of chromosome out. So it's just a matter of time when you leave out a piece that was important for an important gene. So the deterioration of nuclear DNA, uh, well, most of us don't ever come near ironizing radiation, like Homer Simpson, I talk about him a lot. I like this <laughs> fellow. So he works in a pretty bad environment. Um, but there's other reasons. Uh, the enzyme that copies DNA, like I said earlier, is imperfect. The proofreading that it does, again, I can tell you, give you an hour lecture how DNA replication works, it is imperfect. And uh, so sooner or later there will be genes lost that are important. That leads to cancer. So here are two mice, they're of the same age. One has a normal heli case, which is needed for DNA repair, and the other one has no heli case. So it very quickly deteriorates in health and dies. So the deterioration of nuclear DNA is the reason why we have cancer. <coughs> Let me just make you think one minute about this. When you consider conception of a human, so you have this one little cell, zygote. In nine months, you have a six, seven pound baby. And in another 18 years, you have a 70, 80 kilogram adult. 
Do you appreciate the potential of growth of cells? So when somehow when we're adult, <coughs> that stops. And all we do, we replace gone cells, we maintain tissues. Would you appreciate that that is very complicated? How do cells know when it's appropriate to divide and when it's not? And that's a very elaborate mechanism and it fails when you start shooting randomly at your genes. And that is why this is happening here. It's actually a bit disturbing when I hear the slogan of the Cancer Society uh, saying, let's make cancer history. Mm -hmm. This is creating a false hope, mm -hmm. at least now, because from the science that I study, there's no hope in the any foreseeable future that we can do this. It is such an inherent problem the way life works. That so anyway, when you study all this like I'm doing for 30 some years, there's a one question that comes up, that fountain of youth. If you consider some of those biochemical problems are in your genes, are in your proteins, so then how is it even possible that we're still around? So how can you give your child a new start? Right? They, they go through the same periods like we do, so they can live another 80 years, and their children another 80 years. So on the long continuum of life, something must work that we don't run everything in the ground, that would mean extinction. So then how is it even possible that a little fellow like him has a clean slate to start life? And slowly mm -hmm. we're understanding how this is possible. Well, keep in mind, the egg and sperm were made by a person, they're at least adults, sexually mature, who already have all their problems. How could you have made a cell that has a clean slate of proteins and DNA? which they do. And again, if you consider evolution, that we're sitting here, we're not just a product of six million years of primate evolution or a few hundred thousand years of homo sapiens evolution. We are the product of all of evolution. So there's three and a half billion years of cells <laughs> copying their DNA, making proteins, making offspring. There can never have been an interruption or else we wouldn't be here. So somehow nature makes that work. And so this is the, the final <coughs> aspect I want to look at. So it works. So how do we do this? Um, oxidative stress in mitochondria, let me just quickly show you here. Mitochondria come in very large numbers in a cell. And it's now known that, uh, so here would be a cell. And uh, the red mitochondria are the bad ones. The blue ones here, it's hard to see the colors, are the good ones. Nature has figured out how to sort non-functioning mitochondria, put them aside in germ cells, like the one where you make an egg. <coughs> Sperm are not very important. All they produce uh, provide is the nuclear DNA. It's the mother cell that gives the mitochondria to the new child. And the mother actually has figured out a way to sort out the non-functional mitochondria and don't put them in the egg cell. We don't know how the hell it does that, but they do. So there's one cleansing effect nature has invented to sort out bad mitochondria. Also, when ova are produced, again, there's a mechanism. We don't know how it's, how it's accomplished. But somehow, the cell knows which are non-degradable proteins. And it <coughs> screens them out as it makes a reproductive cell as the egg. So nature has found a way to make the clean up the slate, so to speak, to allow new life to start fairly unaltered by all these problems. So uh, let me not tell, if you want to really know about aging sperm, and uh, well, maybe I should quickly tell you, it's very interesting. You may have heard about you know, some celebrities, they have children when they're very old, the men, I'm talking about males. Um, females are much more demanding in terms of having offspring because they have to go through pregnancy. Males just provide the genome for the conception, right? So uh, many old fathers have produced children, and it's very interesting. When you look at old fathers' sperm DNA, there's a lot of small errors. When you look at old mothers, and that's a well-known fact in, uh, in medicine, uh, high maternal age provides a high chance of having something like Down syndrome. What happened here, an entire chromosome was dispatched to the wrong cell. 
Th the reason for this is a, a protein malfunction. Uh, some of you may not know, if you're 50 years, 45 years old, and you ovulate, that single cell that will do the biochemical process has been sitting and waiting to dispatch the chromosomes since you were a four month old fetus. Even before you were born, that cell <coughs> has prepared its chromosomes for that ovulation. So that machinery is just too old, the proteins. So that leads to errors like this. The male is very different. Uh, the male only starts making uh, sperm once they go through puberty. And here's again, sophisticated science, they can measure all this. Because a female makes these ova when they are still a fetus, the very cell that you make in the ovary to become an ovum has only run through 22 rounds of cell division as the little embryo and fetus grew. That's not very many times you can make mistakes happen. Mm -hmm. Take a sperm. So the male grows to become a mature man. Until then, there was no sperm made. You can appreciate then that the precursor for a sperm called spermatogonia has seen many more rounds of cell division during that growth. So it's actually 35 rounds. And now at puberty, let's say it's 15 years for argument's sake, every year a cell that becomes a sperm has seen another 23 rounds of cell division. Now if you take, I'm calculating for you here, at age 40, so we have the 35 rounds of cell division uh, to grow to puberty. Then we have 23 rounds per year, 25 year, if you're from 15 to 40. A sperm mate at that age has seen 610 rounds of DNA replication with all the errors. That's all the little mistakes called point mutations. Uh, fast forward to a 70 year, did I say 70? 60 year old father. In this case, you have 1,070 chances of all the replications to make a little point mutation. And if you sequence them, you can measure this. This is not polar or somebody's head. This is your factual uh, biochemical realities. So that's why actually old fathers uh, create an increased chance of point mutation that may lead to disease. They may be lucky. Maybe most of the problems turn out to be insignificant. It's possible. So anyway, the moral of the story is uh, enjoy life while you have it. And um, in the foreseeable future, we can't prevent aging. Uh, you can, of course, live as healthy as you can, but you just have to kind of accept life the way it is. So anyway, I'm happy to answer any question if I can. Go ahead. What would be the evolutionary um, advantage of testes keep producing and producing until the man dies, vi a viable sperm, given that what you just said? I can only speculate. Uh, nature will take care of it. If anything doesn't work, it will disappear. So, and also you have to realize the human genome, in our case, 1.5% um, of the whole DNA is only genes and only about 0.5% really make coding for proteins and functional RNAs. Mm -hmm. So you can actually mutate lots of stuff with no consequence. So that's why actually 70 year old males have other children that seem to be quite all right. So the chance still is more likely that you cause mutations where they don't matter. It's weird, the genome, our genome like most animals is just full of some people call it junk or of DNA that seems to have no role. <laughs> and let it, let it mutate, which it does. Mm -hmm. Which explains when you break a chromosome, the fixing that happens always leads to a loss of the, the ends to a degree. That's why we can find them. And so if that was in a gene, this gene is gone, it's broken. But because most chromosomal areas don't have genes, we get away with fixing all these double strand breaks and survive. <coughs> this sounds awfully simple, but it sounds like you say that the incidence of cancer has increased because of our longevity. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, people study this uh, very thoroughly to kind of look for the causes of cancer. Uh, I give you one example. Lung cancer was almost unheard of 100 years ago. 
Only when people invented the industrial manufacture of cigarettes, people must have smoked the art pipe before, but people never smoked much until the industrialization mass produced and promoted smoking, produced cigarettes. And then with a delay of about 25 years, starting in the 1930s, lung cancer crept up. And so this is one cancer you can clearly point to a cause. For most other cancers, there is no um, clear smoking gun other than age. Uh, of course, for example, if you have a constant stomach ulcer, that's an inflammation, or hepatitis by a virus, these are constantly not, well, it used to be, we can fix it now, uh, stomach ulcers. Um, constant inflammation by our own immune system. Now, inflammation is caused by a living immune system, causes mutations, and if they're constant, they're likely to cause cancer. So uh, a person's liver who's fighting from the time they got infected with uh, some types of uh, hepatitis viruses, the constant inflammation makes it very likely to them suffer from liver cancer. Liver cancer is very rare. I'm talking primary liver cancer. Many other cancers metastasize in the liver. That's a different story. But cancer originating in the liver is very rare, except in people that have hepatitis. In fact, uh, in people that eat contaminated peanuts in the tropics where there's known carcinogen in mold called aflatoxin. Um, stomach cancer is going down because we now, since about 25 years, late 80s, almost 30 years, we can fix most people's stomach ulcer cause because it's a bacterium and we can kill this Helicobacter pylori with antibiotics. So the ulcer is actually gone and there's no constant inflammation. Asbestos. Interesting, asbestos is just a little silica fiber. In and itself, it's not a mutagen. If you test it in other systems, like in bacteria, it doesn't mutate DNA. Why does it cause lung cancer? Because if we inhale these particles, the white blood cells see this as a dust particle, it doesn't belong there. They try to eat this by phagocytosis and degrade it. But of course, they have no enzymes to degrade the silicon um, inorganic material. So they actually die in the process. More cells get recruited, um, recruited, and you have a constant battle, a constant inflammation. So and that leads to the cancer. In this case, again, it's your immune system that is really the culprit triggered by this environmental problem. So there's very few like I said, smoking guns that uh, you can blame on environmental issues that cause cancer in industrialized countries. Contrary to what a lot of people believe, of course there's uh, carcinogens coming out of a diesel truck's pipe, uh, but unless you inhale enough of this, it won't cause you cancer. Once more, just because something is mutagenic and can cause cancer doesn't mean that it will. It is still a matter of time of exposure and concentration because we have multiple mechanisms to fix these problems and even to kill cancer cells. So if you overload, of course, our system with those toxins, then of course it will cause cancer. But in general, those cancer-causing chemicals, by the way, uh, if you put it to the test, um, rhubarb, radishes, uh, most of the cabbages, they all contain carcinogens. Uh, so in many natural foods, there's carcinogens, and we eat them all the time, but in very small amounts, and they don't cause cancer. You can't prove that they do. In the laboratory, under test conditions, they are. Well, the, uh, the genetic factors that are Yes, um, very few cancers, <coughs> uh, very few cancers actually do run in families. Uh, many, we don't know what it is. Um, we have proteins whose job it is to monitor the progression of cells through proliferation. So it's called a cell cycle. Like when a cell uh, decides, you know, I need to actually replace broken cells and I have to proliferate. 
that's controlled. And so most cells are in a state where the proteins, they're called actually two more suppressor proteins because that's how they were discovered. So most cells in a normal body are in the tissues, they are in a state where proteins tell them, you do not divide because that's not appropriate. When you lose that protein, that checkpoint is lost. So, and of course, these are proteins for which you have genes. And um, nearly all genes, except the sex chromosomal genes, you have twice, one from mom, one from dad. Some people are born with one of those tumor suppressor genes broken. About 5% of people with breast cancer, the girls were born with one of the, they're called B, R, B, C, R, A, one and two genes. So one of those genes is not working. So at first they don't have any tumors because the second gene from the other parent works. But then it is very, very likely that in their own lifetime, in one cell, the working copy is lost. It's very, again, I could spend an hour explaining how does that happen? Why, how come you lose the one good copy? But it's almost guaranteed that it will in these individuals. So. These are, it's only 5% of breast cancer. The majority don't have that reason. But the ones that have that mutation have a cancer risk of like 90% in their lifetime. So there's another gene like that for colon cancer. Um, there's not many. Most cancers are not caused by these kind of things. Go ahead. I've got one question for you, John. Um, you, you talked about uh, some cells becoming worn out and be basically because they're, they're not replaceable, the, the neural tissues, the renal tissue and so forth, yet we're hearing a lot about stem cells. So is there an opportunity for stem cell treatments to replace those which otherwise would not be replaced? Of course. In theory, there's this wonderful animal, uh, I don't know if you heard about the salamander, the axolotl, it's a, it's a tropical salamander. That guy is an expert at this. You can, you might have heard, you can uh, grab uh, a gecko by the tail and they let go of the tail, and they grow a new tail. The tail is not all that exciting. There's some vertebrae there, some muscle and skin. The axolotl, you can cut off his arm, and he'll grow a new arm. The entire limb is reformed in this animal. This is something right here. Kind of shake your head at how is that possible? And so, stem cells are one means of replacing terminally differentiated cells, and in most tissues we have some stem cells left, and researchers are trying to figure out how can I convince them to replace gone cells, that there is hope that that eventually can be tweaked to work. And the striking thing about that crazy axolotl, uh, axolotl is when you study their genes, they don't have any genes that you don't have, it's the way they regulate them. So people are in all kinds of places, in Montreal's uh, research group works on that. They try to understand how is this possible that you can regenerate an entire limb. I mean, take a heart attack. A heart attack will kill <coughs> cardiac muscle tissue, which is irreplaceable in humans because those are terminally differentiated cells. So the neighboring cells don't decide, let's go through proliferation to fix the patch with new muscle cells. Rather, what happens is scar tissue forms that doesn't help contract, it doesn't conduct, so you have dysrhythmia problems and congestive heart failure is all a result of this. If you could only convince stem cells to fill that gap. Yeah. And yeah, people are working on this, but a long ways to go. I mean, you grew a heart when you were an embryo and fetus. Why can't you just grow another one? <laughs> well, the axolotl can do all this. So there, well, nature has different ways of solving these problems, um, but experimenting in some animals is a little easier than manipulating humans. Just, um, I was thinking of the salmon and deciding to die, and I was thinking of all the tests they have done with um, monks, for example, who managed to change all sorts of things in their bodies through meditation through fMRIs that have actually seen the changes in the brain, etc. So I'm, I'm wondering about mind over matter issues. Um, how far can we actually take it in terms of, of aging? Um, some people actually do lie down and die, um, so they have a choice, and, and others, you know, goes on and on and on. 
but have we actually put enough uh, understanding into how our brain regulates a few things that actually mean health or death? I only know the opposite. <laughs> I know the opposite of stress, mm -hmm. like uh, psychological stress. Mm -hmm. uh, people that are constantly stressed. Um, by the way, the person who decides to die, like you referring to, I would like to see a pathologist take this individual apart and see you know, how come you died, like how come your heart stopped, your respiration they have, stopped. They have done that. And, and what, what was ultimately the cause, right? So yes, yeah. I, I'd like to see that. So I, I'll, I'll tell you afterwards. <laughs> so so I, do, I do not know an explanation for this. Mm -hmm. I do know the opposite. Um, people are, are stressed. In fact, stress is interesting. Stress is defined as uh, you have challenges that you can't cope with, so you actually are really in distress. So and when you measure corticosteroid levels, like cortisol, which is natural stress hormone, it's a steroid hormone, there, are, there we go again, it binds to a steroid hormone receptor, which goes to the nucleus and it controls genes. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it controls hundreds of genes, some directly, some indirectly, and when you measure the gene expression profile on people who are stressed all the time, they express all kinds of genes differently. And almost any parameter of health and disease you look at is worse in people who are constantly under the influence of corticosteroids. By the way, some people are treated medically with cortisone and you know, betamethasone, dexamethasone. We use them in medicine for very ill people who need the immune system to kind of be suppressed because they have terrible inflammation and we don't know where else to stop it. These drugs, because of this, cause terrible side effects that we actually know. So basically, you, you can create those side effects to a degree yourself by being stressed all the time. And I would presume a monk who is happy and at peace with his lifestyle, um, not having 15 screaming kids around them and students, <laughs> uh, probably can uh, go a little, <coughs> little less stressful through their life, mm -hmm. one, one presumes. Perhaps one more question at the back, Verna? Oh, thank you, John. Um, John, thank you for being here. I'm going to drink a lot for a minute and see if it gets to the question. I hope it will. So, my mind is going to be I have to come close. <laughs> <laughs> we have the degenerative side that we've been talking about, and often uh, the great detail that we're learning about as the human species about that degeneration. Mm -hmm. And then we have the regenerative side that Sabina was talking about that has centuries um, of both what someone might call anecdotal or stories or might go much deeper and call it um, knowledge holders and a knowledge base beyond what we can know in that chemical test tube world. So there's the degenerative side and the regenerative side. Then there's that whole part of the human cycle and what creates tipping points for us, whether it's stress or whatever else it is, that put us into either chronic or, um, what's the other one? Acute. Acute disease situations or breakdown situations. I'm wondering if the future of geriatric medicine or or healing, which is again from each of those two worlds, medicine or healing, could be looking at each, each of us as to what those degenerative and regenerative patterns are. And that would be longevity would come from expanding the regenerative side, obviously, and minimizing the degenerative side, whatever is going on there. Then do you think that the mapping of an individual organism, myself, for example, because I'm in this process, looking at, OK, when do the breakdowns occur, and when does it go the other way? And it's fascinating to get way into detail on the degeneration, and then go, wait a minute, October 24th, that changed completely. Why was that? So then I looked, I kept, look, I started looking that up and went, well, now who would have thought that? Well, in a 10-minute doctor's appointment, or even in my own fitness time or whatever it is, I would not have figured that out. But I happen to have quite a bit of time right now and got to look at that. Well, then we each become our own resource um, for whether we're in a regenerative or a degenerative stage, which doesn't mean we created it. It just means we're the best chance to understand it, whether you get hit by a bus and look backwards and go, dang, it was icy, and you know, 
all of those kinds of elements, or it's a long-term illness. Do you think, then, that putting the two together, regenerative and degenerative experiences, would be the future of geriatric medicine? <laughs> I have to say that this is out of my field. Um, like you said, I, I'm more the, the test tube uh, biochemical person. And, uh, I can't really speak to the regenerative side that you refer to. And we need both. I mean, that's the point. We can't get up the boxing level, who I think my weight's better than yours. Because if I break my leg, I want the test tube person to be in surgery, knowing what they're doing, and making sure I don't come up to infection. Mm -hmm. I mean, and we're kind of right now in two different camps with a whole lot of information coming out of both camps because we're not talking to people. I'm listening. <laughs> Perhaps the sort of research uh, that, that Sabina was talking about, showing the links between uh, mind and, uh, and biochemistry is the sort of things that would be the, the next steps there. Please join me in thanking John for his presentation. John, I have a question for a now you're developing a collection that takes as much as if you had won the, uh, the Daybreak Mod call. Uh, thank you again. Thank you I hope much. to see you all in two weeks. Thanks for coming, folks. Yeah, I think this is the